Hi, I'm Ethan, I love muzzleloading, and this is your muzzleloading news for the week. This week, the muzzleloading community was dealt a real blow, I think, uh, especially when it comes to getting people started and interested in muzzleloading. This week, Bill Raby's YouTube channel was suspended. Bill shared on the American Long Rifles forum that every single one of his 200 traditional muzzleloader building videos had been taken off of YouTube and he had been served a two week suspension. Bill has appealed this decision and YouTube has allowed for 26 of his 200 videos to stay up, but um, I think justifiably Bill is looking at moving away from YouTube as soon as his suspension is up here in the next week or so now. Bill has said that he's gonna be transitioning his 200 videos over to the video sharing platform Rumble. It's gonna take a little bit of time to get caught up on that huge backlog though. He says that Rumble's a little slow and with 200 videos, I think no matter what platform or what kind of connection you have, it's gonna be a long time to get those uploaded. So be patient with Bill Raby. His videos, I think, are some of the best contemporary videos out there. I mean, 200 videos, I think to build a single muzzleloader, he was close to 100 videos per muzzleloader, kind of starting, you know, averaging around like 75 videos. Super thorough videos, super helpful videos for anybody interested in getting away from the kits and starting to build some of their own muzzleloaders from a blank, but uh, it's, a, it's a real blow to the community here. That being said, all of the I Love Muzzleloading videos are gonna be backed up on odyssey.com. Odyssey is another video sharing platform that is set up with uh, libraries blockchain. So it's set up that no matter what platform you use, as long as they use the library blockchain, I believe, I'm not super well versed on all of this, it's all secure and can't be totally removed from the internet like it is if you upload something only to YouTube, where YouTube can decide that it's done, you're gone and you're out. So we'll have a link to Bill Raby's Rumble video sharing channel down below and also a link to the I Love Muzzleloading backup on odyssey.com. Kentucky's Corps of Long Riflemen is looking for competitive teams to compete in the 21st annual Kentucky Cup. This match is held on July 17th, 2021. It's gonna be held at the Kentucky Long Rifles Range in Moorhead, Kentucky. Teams are open to any club in Kentucky. Any muzzleloading firearm is allowed. No telescopic sights, five person teams, four target ag aggregate, Pre-registration is required before July 1st, so you still have a little bit of time to get a team together and get registered for this. We'll have a link to the flyer in the description below and we'll be hosting it on ilovemuzzleloading.com. You can check that out as well. But uh, it's a good chance to get out and have some fun shooting and uh, contribute to a good cause. In rather exciting news, I think, for anybody that shoots modern muzzleloaders, we're starting to see Hodgdon branded Blackhorn 209 bottles appearing in stores. This week in the CVA Shooters Facebook group, a photo was shared of an order of Blackhorn that came in with the Hodgdon logo on it, which pretty much confirms, I think for me at least, that Hodgdon is shipping and is distributing Blackhorn 209. This isn't any reserve stock left over from when Western Powders owned the powder and the brand. This is definitely something new, not necessarily new as far as recipe goes, but new as in this is a new bottle that has been recently produced and Hodgdon is keeping up with their promise to deliver Blackhorn 209 as well as their other modern black powder substitutes to shooters in time for the competitive season for 2021, as well as the hunting season coming up. A lot of the states out west are revealing their draw results, and so shooters are getting their supplies around, and Blackhorn was one of the key things that nobody was able to find. We're starting to see some primers coming in, and we're starting now to see this Hodgdon branded Blackhorn 209, which is fantastic news, and I'm really excited that Hodgdon you know, stayed in there with us and uh, was very patient with all the shooters that I think were, were pretty frustrated with it but we are seeing these bottles coming in and this is great news. In good news as well, we're starting to see other modern muzzleloading supplies coming into stock now around the country. Mainly this photo in Maryland shows a pretty well stocked store with modern muzzleloading supplies from modern muzzleloader projectiles with Sabos and things to some of the IMR White Hots and Hodgdon black powder substitute products. So it's been a long wait here. We're now into mid June when early on we thought, you know, mid to late March would be having these supplies back in stock, but we're in mid June, we're starting to get them. And hopefully these manufacturers start to see them increase demand that we have for their products over the last year with a bunch of people getting interested in muzzle loading and they try to bump up the manufacturing on all of this. I know that they've been producing a ton of the modern stuff 24 seven and the muzzleloading stuff I assume just kind of gets worked in there, but hopefully we can get some more buying power out there and more production power behind the modern muzzleloading. Traditional muzzleloading enthusiasts haven't been too affected by this. Uh, I mean, I think primarily number 11 caps have been the big issue, 
But um, black powder, traditional black powder, has been in stock now for a few months. So this is, this is good news across the board that we're starting to see all this stuff coming back into stock and available for shooters around the country. In a Facebook post shared earlier this week, we finally got our first look at the new Knight Peregrine rifle. This is Knight's new 40 caliber long range muzzleloader. Enthusiasts got a little worried after the June 1st launch date where we didn't see a whole lot of details about the Knight Peregrine. But now a couple weeks later, we are now seeing our first look at it and it does look nice. Fans of Knight aren't gonna see a whole lot of differences between this and some of the other rifles, but in a way, that's a really good thing. Knight hasn't gone back to the drawing board. They aren't trying to reinvent the wheel here. They say, they're saying, look, we have a platform. We know it performs. We have the championships to prove it. And we're just gonna build a smaller caliber, heavy hitter, just like we always have. The photo caption says, our gunsmith is touching up the brand new Knight Peregrine. This is Knight Rifle's newest 10 millimeter muzzleloader that is still in the works. This beast has an impressive muzzle velocity and a fast twist rate with long range lethal accuracy. Every shot is powerful, fast and accurate. Pre-orders soon. This is one of the main questions that came up when the June 1st launch date came around was when can we pre-order it? What are some more of the details? So it's good that we're getting a little bit of a, of a pre-order crumb there, knowing that they're gonna be opened up soon, but we still don't have a whole lot of other details, at least officially in this post or officially on their website about this. Knight representatives have been fielding questions online and on the forums quite a bit over the last couple of weeks since that June 1st launch date. You know, explaining that this is going to function a lot like the Knight Mountaineer, a lot like the Knight 500, similar chassis technology, faster twist rate. We're looking at, I think, a 1 in 16 twist. This has not been confirmed, though. I think in December or January of next year, we're going to be looking back on 2021 as the year of the 40 caliber extreme long range muzzleloader. Now with Knight revealing these pictures, we have we know we have the Paramount HDR coming out at some point here as well. So it's now coming down to a race, I think, between both of these companies to see who can get their muzzleloaders out first. So hunters preparing for the 2021 fall hunting season can get them, get them tested and uh, get them sighted in and get them ready for their hunt. So it's gonna be interesting to see what happens here as we head towards fall. To wrap it up for this week, we've gotten word that the Rock Island Auction Company has been updating their catalog for the September 2021 premiere auction. I think particularly of interest coming up with this is some of the super early European muzzleloaders that they already have cataloged. There's some fantastic wheel locks, match locks and things. I think the artistic style of these is what's really gonna set them apart from some of the auctions, especially the May premiere and the auctions that they had last year and any auction really previously. These are some exquisite European muzzleloaders that I think really represent kind of a peak artistry when it comes to the muzzleloading world. So check out Rock Island Auction Company on social media. They're gonna be posting photos because they already have been. They're gonna be posting a ton of photos leading up to the September auction. Once again, I'm Ethan. I love muzzleloading. Thank you so much for watching. If there's a muzzleloading news story that you think we should be reporting on, please let us know down in the comments or contact us at ilovemuzzleloading at gmail.com. I'd be happy to add it to the roster for the next muzzleloading news video. If you can't catch us on YouTube, I wanna say that we also have the I Love Muzzleloading podcast that just launched last week with its first interview. We talked to Frank House, one of the legendary House brothers, about his journey in contemporary long rifle culture. And uh, we got into some neat talking points about getting young people and getting more people interested in muzzleloading, which was really fantastic to hear from Frank, who has been an icon of muzzleloading for decades now. He's kind of looking back on it as a retrospective in a way seeing that there's a whole lot of potential here. He's seen a lot of the same interest in muzzleloading growing over the last year, and he's super excited about it. So check out that interview. You can listen at ilovemuzzleloading.com slash podcast. I will say that we've just transitioned the podcast hosting from a platform called Anchor to a platform called Sounder. Sounder's offering us a lot more features and options at the scale that we're at over Anchor. This isn't sponsored or anything, but I, I bring it up because there might be a little hiccup here in a couple episodes as that transition completes, but within a week or so, everything should be hunky-dory and we should be back to kind of the normal distribution thing. So if there are any issues or anything, check out ilovemuzzleloading.com and we'll update as we can with anything that, any problems or issues that arrive and, uh, and when they're resolved. So I'd like to say thank you for everybody that's been listening and watching. We just passed the 100 subscriber mark on YouTube, which is really exciting. Did it in uh, just about less than a month. So it's really exciting to me that people love muzzleloading as much as I do and they wanna hear and see more about it. So 
a lot of neat things planned for the summer. You can kind of see back here on the bench, I've got uh, something fun in the gun case and uh, we're gonna be sharing that some here in the coming days. So thank you so much for watching and we'll catch you next time. I went to, uh, got in the old CETA program at Votex School up here at Welding and uh, went up and took a welding test at Jeff Boat Shipyard in March of 1978. I got my GED and passed the damn welding test, which is the worst thing I ever did in my life. And went up there to work. I had barely turned 18 year old as a welder first class. Wow. And, and, and God almighty, I had no idea. It's like going to prison, except they just let you go home at night. <laughs> it was pretty rough place to work for an 18 year old kid. I can imagine. Still wet behind the ears and had never really been outside of anything bigger than Woodbury, Kentucky, which the population is 81. <laughs> and I went to Jeff boat shipyards across the river from Louisville. Uh -huh. Ugh. But then I got in from there. I went from there and got got in the boiler makers and worked there on a, as a permit hand, uh, which was on, you know, it's just a, if you had skills, they would let you go to work, but you weren't a journeyman. You really weren't part of the union. Mm -hmm. And then I got in the apprentice program, but work was really, really, really tight. And so I started working with Herschel when I was off. I'd work with Herschel out there building guns. I started out there in 79. I was 19 and built, I think, seven guns out there with him over the next two or three years. Mm -hmm. And uh, then in 1988, uh, there again, I was a journeyman bowler maker by that time, but work there again, work tightened up. There wasn't any work anywhere. And I just had a little shop there, and I went in, and I went to Sears, and bought a bandsaw and a spindle shaper and a grinder and set me up a little shop, went to work, started building guns. And then when they called me to go to work bowler making, I said, kiss my ass, I'm staying here. <laughs> <laughs> and I always said, the last year I was a bowler maker, I made $44,000, and the first year I was a gun maker, I made 4400 <laughs> I can imagine that was quite the change. Yeah, it was. It was 